Hey, welcome to the Karma You podcast. How are you today? Thank you very much. I'm I'm fine, thank you. I mean, this uh, whole Corona things is getting on everybody's nerves. I think so. I'm really a bit tired of this, but what can I do? I can't change anything. Huh? Yeah, yeah, right there with you. Can you share a little bit about what it is that you do and how you got to where you are today? Uh, well, actually, I'm a psychotherapist and um, I do a lot of seminars and I'm writing books. And yes, how I got to this, you, you mean how I uh, come to this concept of the inner child or to the book or yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, tell us about. So your your new book is called "The Child in You," and it's done incredibly well in Germany, and uh, it's, it's released in England now. And um, yeah, can you tell us about how you how you came to write that book, and and also what is what do you mean by the inner child? Well, uh, the inner child actually is a. Uh, nothing really new in psychotherapy or in psychology, but I invented a new approach to the inner child. And uh, I invented this through my work as a psychotherapist. <clears throat> and that's the reason why my approach is very pragmatic and hands-on. And in my model, the shadow child um, represents, represents um, our childhood imprints that we all develop during our upbringing. And the shadow child stands for the rather uh, problematic imprints because there are not such things as perfect parents and perfect childhoods. And one, what one has to know is that when we are born, our brain is only 25% developed. And this is only about very, very basic functions of the brain, like the regulation of hunger and satiety or the re regulation of uh, thirst or heat. And all higher brain functions like our differentiated emotional system or higher cognitive functions uh, will be um, developed during our upbringing. So our first caregivers who are usually our parents, um, have a huge impact on how our brain will be configured, you know. So all the synapses uh, connect and build up. And uh, so these deep imprints uh, work later on in life, like lenses we look through to see the world. I just want to make an example. For example, um, I have, yes, in my book, Michael plays <laughs> plays a role. And uh, Michael, uh, Michael's parents uh, were running a bakery and they have had four children. So they were often overwhelmed to meet their children's need for, um, for, um, for care and really uh, to see their, their children's needs. And so little Michael, had often the feeling um, that his parents just didn't really care for him. And as any little child, little Michael didn't think, oh, mommy and daddy are totally overwhelmed and maybe they shouldn't have had four children. But he thought and felt, I'm not enough. I'm I'm a burden. I'm too much here. And this is how these deep-rooted beliefs come about. And these beliefs are really, they are having such a big impact on our feelings and, and, and thinking and all our behaviors <clears throat> because these deep imprints uh, uh, are carried over into adulthood later. So the adult Michael still often thinks that he's not enough, that he's not important. So when his girlfriend, Sarah, for example, just forgets such a simple thing as to buy his <clears throat> favorite chips, he doesn't think, oh, she has forgotten to buy my chips, but he thinks and feels, um, oh, here we are again. My, my needs are not important. She doesn't love me. 
um, I'm not enough, so she doesn't care for me. And of course, these feelings and thinking leads to an external behavior. And this behavior is often that he starts uh, that he starts discussing and fighting and having arguments with Sarah. And Sarah herself has an inner child, a shadow child. And uh, Sarah's parents cared very well for her, but they set uh, set very narrow boundaries, and they they have had awfully precise ideas about right and wrong. So Sarah often couldn't meet the expectations of her parents, and she got often the feeling that she she's not enough as well. So one can easily imagine how these two inner childs you know, are starting to 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 get entangled within this relationship and their discussions because uh, um, Michael is more the type who's who who starts getting angry and starts um, starts arguments and starts fighting, and Sarah is more the sulking type. So she's withdrawing and starts sulking up to three days. And if they had both a clear idea why they act like this and why they feel often like this, if they had a clear idea about their shadow child, they could start um, to get a healthy distance from these old childhood programs. So, so interesting. And it's interesting because I remember when I, I'm a therapist as well. I remember when I first started having clients, I was really surprised in a way that a lot of people didn't know about the fact that your early life experiences can impact you later in life. And I think people are talking about this more, but still I hear from people saying things like, you know, my parents were brilliant, they were great, I could never blame them for things that that happened. Is that something that you notice that people don't want to blame their parents or make them wrong or kind of admit that maybe they caused problems for them? Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing is that uh, children have a very deep loyalty to their parents and these loyalty is often also carried over into adult life. So uh, it's very important to me that I explain my clients that it is not about blaming the parents, but uh, it's all about to get a clear idea uh, about your own psychological and mental programs. And if you want to have a clear idea of that, you have to have a look on your own upbringing because there are all these imprints uh, uh, made because what I said at the beginning that we that we are born with an unfinished brain. And um, but if people have a strong resistance to 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 look on their uh, imprints, um, that is often a hint that they are still in this very very deep loyalty, and that means actually that they still rather blame themselves than blaming their parents, because that is what little children do, like Michael. Michael didn't think mommy and daddy are overwhelmed, and maybe they should take some um, parenting uh, advice, but he thought and felt, I'm too much, I'm not enough, so he blamed himself. And this um, pattern is uh, often um, stays within adulthood. So people prefer to um, blame themselves uh, rather over blaming their parents. I once had a client who's who stuck very, uh, very deeply to his old belief systems of his shadow child, and although he it was to him mentally clear that it all came from his very difficult childhood, but he couldn't just, he couldn't detach from these old belief systems. So I asked him, uh, listen, usually we never do anything, although it seems weird or it seems objectively uh, destructive, 
that we stick to old systems, but it, we always have a good reason. Maybe could you take a moment to think and feel what is the good reason that you stick so strongly to your old belief systems and to your shadow child? So he went into himself, so he, he got a deeper connection or build up a deeper connection to his own feelings at this moment. And then it suddenly uh, came into his mind and he said quite spontaneously, well, if I would get, get rid of my old belief systems, I really had to admit how, how really bad it was with my alcoholic mother. It was somehow clear in his head. Yes, uh, she was an addict. It was bad. But actually, it didn't touch his feelings. And then he suddenly he suddenly understood. If he wanted to de de detach from his old belief systems, he really had emotionally to admit how, how bad it really was with his alcoholic mother. And that is often the reason why people um, have an inner resistance to to proceed to new beliefs and and you know to a healthier healthier belief system and healthier feelings, which are re represented in my approach by the sun child, by the shadow child, the sun child, and the inner adults. That are the three um, mental entities with which I'm working uh, in my approach and. Within my experience, uh, these three entities are absolutely sufficient to solve almost any problem with it. Yeah. So, so the shadow child is the the kind of the part of us that is holding on to the imprints that are maybe less desirable, that are holding us back or causing us kind of problems. And then the the sun child is that the more I don't want to use the words like positive and negative, but the more favorable side of the inner child. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The uh, sun child um, stands, first of all, for our positive imprints because the most parents uh, do quite a few things right after all. And not everything had been bad in our childhood. And Moreover, and very, very important, the sun child stands for <clears throat> all the new beliefs, the new behavior, uh, the new attitudes we are able to shape now as adults because we are not longer at the mercy of our parents. So we are able now to come to, to, to new insights, to new attitudes and to new beliefs, so, uh, which are much more realistic for our current life. And is gaining awareness of this enough to change it? So if we start to, to sort of dig into our past and we look at things that have left those imprints and we acknowledge that our parents may have been responsible, is that enough or what other sort of process needs to take place to start to, to change that? In my experience, awareness is a big, big part of it because as soon as you um, become aware of these old programs, you can create a little distance to them. Um, what I try to really um, to make an uh, experiences for my clients and for my readers is the thing that these these all these beliefs actually don't belong to you but belong to your parents because they're actually not a certificate for your self-esteem or your self-worth. If you think I'm not enough, then it actually doesn't say anything about your worth, but it says only something about the at last, at least partial overwhelm of your parents. And I created a little and very, very simple exercise, but which is actually so helpful in daily life. And this exercise um, is named uh, switch, nee, 
catch yourself and switch, catch yourself and switch. So what I do with my readers and with my clients is that we really draw down this shadow chart on paper, on paper. That is so helpful. You know, you, you make... You create a little silhouette of a little child. You you write down next to the head, mommy and daddy, and then you you note down um, you note down in in, in short terms, in, in short um, keywords how they've treated you, and then you think about what are my beliefs. You go in yourself to feel what are my beliefs, and you know these beliefs in the chest area of this little child because they are here. You know, that are your beliefs. And then you figure out which feelings are typically linked to these beliefs. For example, with Michael, um, when he doesn't feel enough, first of all, he feels hurt and injured. And then very quickly angry. That is what we, what everybody knows, this connection between, you know, uh, in injury and uh, when your self-esteem um, is hurt that you get angry. So Michael is injured and angry. These are his typical uh, shadow child feelings. And then that is most importantly, I uh, figure out with the readers or my clients, what are your self-protection strategies? So what do you do with all this program to compensate it? And for Michael it is, for example, a typical self-protection uh, strategy that he's striving for perfectionism perfectionism and but he also tries always be on top of the things to be in power so to control things he's a control freak he's a perfectionist and these are his typical self-protection strategies and if you have really this picture of your shadow child in front of you it gets so clear to most of the people hey that is all my problems and issues are about it's it's always the same. It's just a topic and variation of the topic. So, and that creates a distance to come back to your questions. I haven't forgotten it. Um, uh, and then in your daily life, when you're completely aware of your shadow child, um, then all you have to do is to keep this awareness in your daily life. And as soon as you catch yourself, oh, I'm again in my shadow child mode. Yes, I'm injured. I'm angry. You know, I'm, I, I, I think again that I'm not enough or that uh, people just don't see me, don't respect me. Uh, then you have an awareness now because you reflected on your shadow child. You became aware of your program and then you catch yourself and then you switch either to the adult eye. The adult eye stands for our rational thinking. The adult eye, so to say, the seed of reason. Uh, in the adult eye, the emotions don't play a role, but just this rational thinking. And when you um, switch to your adult eye, that means that you uh, get into the observer position. And when you are in the observer position, you can look from the outside on yourself, which is actually the core of self-reflection, that you can, you know, create this little distance and look from the outside on yourself. And from there, Michael could um, see just in time before he starts getting angry, oh, it's Sarah, it's not mommy. And she just has forgotten to, to buy a bag of chips, that's all. And she has forgotten to buy the bag of chips because she's not perfect and neither am I. So this whole interpretation of I'm not enough and I'm not important and so on, he could stop it in uh, just in time, in the right time, because before he starts getting too angry because Strong feelings, be it anger, be it uh, sadness, be it uh, uh, um, anxiety, be it even positive feelings like enthusiasm or, you know, when you fall in love, you know, you're full of positive feelings. All strong feelings do block our rational thinking.
So you the 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 point is you have to catch yourself on time before your feelings start getting too strong. And I know from so many people who are exercising this, they tell me just even only by this uh, exercise of catching and, and, and switching that they have changed within weeks and months uh, their mental programs. And then, of course, the sunshine came, comes into play because um, what my approach makes different to other approaches to the inner child is first of all you you don't it's not only about feelings like in 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 former approaches but it's about the feelings it's about the self-protection strategies and it's about this clear target state the clear vision of your healthy self um, which is represented by the sunshine so it's much much easier to let old programs go when you have a new program, you know, but a new and realistic program where you can um, stick to. It's much easier, you know, if you have a clear vision when I'm not anymore the shadow child, but what what am I then? You know, what 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 is um what describes me, who who I am then if I'm not the old shadow child. So that is why the sun child vision is so important. Yeah, it's so brilliant. It's so useful. And as you were talking, I was I was thinking about today and I was thinking there was probably several times where the hurt child in me has become activated and I've had to sort of reason with myself and try to bring in that adult part to not snap at my partner or get kind of annoyed about something or, yeah, sort of express that that shadow child. And uh, how amazing if we could be, be more aware and start to catch those programs and those patterns before they escalate. And uh, it's really interesting when you were talking about, you know, when we're engaging with another person, that there's two inner childs, you know, <laughs> engaging with all their, you know, programming and all those imprints that they've they've carried. And, have, you know, no wonder we struggle with our relationships and we, you know... <laughs> find that difficult when sometimes it's the children, the hurt and angry children that are in charge and not the and not the adults. I think uh, the beauty of it is that it's actually so simple. And that is the reason why this book is so extremely successful. Because it's not about that you have to work through all your childhood experiences again and again, which is actually uh, proven uh, in recent neurobiological studies uh, uh, for not being um, good and appropriate because the more and more you go into this old um, hurt feelings and these old wounds, the more and more you establish your synapses and your um, these paths within your brain, you make them broader and broader for these negative feelings and 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 uh, patterns. And I think, and that is my whole experience uh, as a psychotherapist, what people actually uh, do need to know is the central theme. The central theme, the central theme of Michael's childhood is that he was because of the overwhelm of his parents, sometimes neglected. And that his parents couldn't meet his needs for attachment and for bonding uh, in a in an appropriate way. That is the overall topic of his childhood. So he hasn't. It's not necessary that he works through all these um, uh, memories and experiences that he has had with his uh, parents. But to know this is. This is my shadow child. This is actually the matrix, the matrix I'm living in. That is my matrix, the, the shadow child. So uh, every time when I get the feeling, which I get very, very easily in my adult life, because I have this shadow child wound, that somebody is not respecting me, that somebody seemingly not respecting me, seemingly um, thinks I'm not important. I have to be very, very careful, but... 
because then I'm in the old matrix of my childhood, which is uh, not anymore true for my adult life. And really to give, you can do this also really by imagining, by making an inner picture to give these old beliefs back to your parents because they belong to them, um, because they're totally arbitrary. If Michael's parents um, behaved differently toward him and had more time and maybe um, fewer children, just maybe just Michael, he would have um, developed completely different beliefs that makes clear how arbitrary these beliefs are. And then the, ch the sun child, um, the, one of the first steps you do within creating the sun child that you build new beliefs, new beliefs which are realistic and appropriate um, for your adult being. For example, in Mike's case, it could be, I'm enough. And if you feel too, uh, uh, too strong resistance uh, against the belief I'm enough, then you could shape it into I'm enough for my children or I'm enough for my friends, because it's uh, most important that the new beliefs that you can accept the new beliefs, at least by your adult eye, i.e. by your um, rational mind and your rational thinking that you say, yes, that is much more appropriate to have this belief. And then it comes to the self-reflection strategy. So we come from self-protection to self-reflection. If um, Mike's self-protection strategy is perfectionism and always keeping the power and to be in control. He could think about more appropriate behaviors. That is, for example, to say good is good enough. I do, don't need to be perfect because my perfectionism is has the only aim and goal um, to make myself um, somehow bulletproof. Because if I often think and feel that I'm not enough, um, many people who have this belief, and there are many, their, their, their aim in life is not to achieve certain goals, but only to defend themselves um, from injuries. So their aim is actually not being defended, uh, not being offended, not being offended. So their aim is to keep away um, any criticism or any rejection. And they unconsciously think the best way for this is to be perfect because if I'm perfect, I'm flawless. And if, I flaw, if I'm flawless, nobody can criticize me or can reject me. But, you know, there's... This self-protection strategy, it doesn't amount to anything because there's always a higher, better and bigger, you know. So um, it's much yeah. better to work directly on your self-esteem that you establish a feeling of being enough and uh, also under the condition that you make mistakes and that you have some shortcomings and uh, to establish the idea good is good enough. Yes, and instead of always, you know, um, take control and to be on the top of things, um, to establish a little bit more trust and to get on eye level with other people. Yeah, I relate to that a lot personally. And I know that it's impossible to try to control what every other person in the world thinks of you. And yet yes. that's almost what we're trying to do when we're trying to sort of project this image of perfection. It's just impossible. And uh, I'm going to I'm gonna make a guess that 100% of the people listening to this podcast now probably relate to not feeling good enough in some way. I, yes. I imagine, you know, it's so, so common, isn't it? And, and yet people always think they're they're the only ones that think that, you know, time and time again, I notice that we we sort of think, oh, everyone else has got it all figured out and only I am deficient and that sort of thing, but it's just not the case. Um, I really wanted to ask you, because I know you've done a lot of work on introversion and extroversion, and I was really curious, can you share a bit about that? Is it something that's genetic? Is it something that we can change? 
you know, I know, I know as well that most people listening to this podcast are probably going to identify as introverts as well. So I don't, yeah, I wonder what you could could uh, share about that. Yes, introversion and extroversion are meant to be uh, highly uh, genetic. And I think uh, many parents can uh, confirm that, uh, that some children are just more and more introvert and others just more extrovert. Uh, basically, uh, this is a concept of um, energy, um, how, you, how you recharge actually your batteries. Extroverts recharge their batteries by nice contacts uh, with the outer world. They need more input. They need more connection to other people. And introverts recharge their batteries by um, being alone for a time. For example, if an introvert comes um, home from work, he usually needs at least half an hour just to be on himself, you know, to recharge his batteries. And, and the extrovert can easily in other times than Corona, go to the pub after the work because and meet some people and have a nice chat, you know, and because he's or she is recharging her batteries uh, within with with having nice nice chat or to be in contact with other people. But there are so many other uh, psychological traits clinging to these conceptions. Extroverts uh, are more prone to take risks. They're a bit a little bit more superficial. They are they have easier times to make decisions. Um, they are more talkative. They can talk while thinking. Um, they uh, need more company. They um, can uh, represent themselves better on stage or within a team setting, you know, talking and to present themselves and their ideas. Introverts are um, more risk adverse, they think more. Yes, no, they um, they are more careful, and actually, they they indeed have less excellence than extroverts have. Um, they go more into the depth. They can concentrate very, very long and focus very, very long uh, without any interruption on on a concept, on a work. So um, there are so many psychological traits uh, that belong. To to these concepts and I've been writing a whole book about personality types and this book is all about these inborn traits and actually that is what I find so interesting my book the child in you is about um, your childhood experiences how your experience that you make in life especially with your parents shape so many of your it shapes your self-esteem actually Self, your self-esteem and the self-esteem is the epicenter is the epicenter of our psyche so if an extrovert child meets parents who are neglecting it it will develop probably the same belief i'm not enough but because uh, the child is extrovert it has different self-protection strategies the extrovert's child is more prone to seek help uh, from teachers or talk, you know, to talk out and talk about its problems or the extrovert adult later, while the introvert child is more prone, you know, maybe to deep dive into its world of fantasies and books and movies, to withdraw, to withdraw, to keep uh, himself, um, um, how do you say, uh, not injured, um, uh, keep, safe, or yeah, keep himself safe. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, whereas the extrovert child uh, will tend to, you know, go more into the outward world to to play with friends, to forget while playing with friends, or to open up and to talk people to seek actively help for its uh, problems at home. So the self protection strategies and the way uh, the children are dealing with their problems um, will be different. So, so interesting. And um, yeah, I think sometimes I, I consider myself an introvert and sometimes there can be the sense of, 
oh, you know, we should be an extrovert. Like society maybe values extroverts in more highly in certain situations, definitely. But thinking of it as something that's genetic and actually thinking that there are really positive aspects to being an introvert. Me. I like that. I often wish I yeah. was introvert because introverts, yeah. like my husband is introvert. <laughs> And I admire his independency of the outer world. You know, he could, for 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 days and weeks. You know, he could uh, dive into his books and into his movies. And I'm so, I feel always so um, dependent on you know uh, on uh, community and friends and you know <laughs> to see each other and so. Introverts have many, many uh, wonderful, um, wonderful abilities. Yeah, good. And I suppose as well, during lockdown, the extroverts have not been okay, so I hear. Have hard, yeah, had maybe, maybe a harder for time. Us. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's better to be an introvert after all. That's good. Good news. Um, thank you so much for everything you've shared. I think it's so, so useful. And just having that awareness of how these imprints from our childhood can hold us back and how we don't have to let them continue to rule our lives, that we can do things to, to help ourselves. I think that's one of the things I really took away from your, your book, this kind of hopefulness that we don't, you know, we can change things and we can, we can work through the, the limitations that we may have. Can you share about where people can find out more about you and um, anything else that you're offering or where they can buy your book and, and that sort of thing? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, the book is everywhere available where you can buy books, uh, be it in the internet, be it in the bookstore. And I have an English uh, website that is Stephanie Star, like my name, but I guess my name will be in your show notes as well. Yes. Stephanie yes. Star, one word, and then dot com. And there, I share my concept and I have also um, some meditations that you can download there for the shadow child and for the sun child to establish the, to, to comfort the uh, shadow child on a deeper level to, to, to uh, make your sun child shine. And I have a um, personality test about how much closeness you need in a relationship. So there are many things and uh, and uh, about the concepts of my book and everything you can find on stephaniestar.com and I'm on Instagram as well. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for everything you shared. Great. Yeah, thank you for having me.